Hi everybody, I'm Mr. Yeoman, and what I'm going to try to do is fill you in while Mrs. Engel is out um, on the principles of ecology. I know that you've started talking about the food system um, and how that kind of relates to some of the things that you already know. Um, I kind of want to expand on that, and in order to understand where our food comes from, we need to understand ecosystems as a whole. Um, so one of the things that I always do is I start uh, start these types of units with a quote. So in this case, it is by um, Juvenal, uh, never does nature say one thing and wisdom another. Um, and so I think this kind of makes sense in, in the way that we always choose as humans, we always choose to do things sort of in our own way. But when we fight nature, we're always going to end up losing because, uh, you know, nature has all these resources um, and you know, it just kind of fights back. And so we can try to overcome that, but eventually something can come along to destroy whatever we build. Um, so I just want to kind of have you keep that in mind as we're going through. So what I want you to think about for just a second is uh, look around the room and think about where all of the different pieces um, come from. Okay, so uh, this is a man-made room. Um, you know, you have a, a whiteboard, you have concrete cinder blocks, uh, drywall, wiring. Where do all of those things come from? And so the easy answer is nature. You know, we could stop if you want to stop and uh, think about um, the actual locations. Um, you're welcome to do that if you want to pause the video. Uh, but really what we're taking a look at is um, that we depend on nature in general. So soil, we depend on the soil for food. We uh, depend on air for breathing. Um, water, uh, which we'll get into a little bit more later on, um, water is a natural resource that in the U.S. we don't, we kind of take that for granted. And I think that the Flint situation um, in Flint, Michigan, uh, with the lead in the water, I think has really brought to attention some of the ideas of what happens when you don't have access to clean water. And there's a huge segment of the world population that does not have access to clean water. Um, so that's something that uh, you kind of want to think about. We just turn on the faucet and think, all right, that's clean. We can drink that right out of the sink, right out of the hose. Um, you know, it's a very different um, idea in other parts of the world. And definitely we rely on other organisms to survive as well. Um, so I don't care if you're a vegetarian, those other organisms, um, we have to uh, eat other organisms, whether that is all plants or a mixture of plants and animals, um, those are living things. One of the things that gets ignored a lot are uh, the free services that uh, plants and really just nature in general provide. Uh, a lot of times as humans, um, especially a, a society like the U.S., where really something has value if it has something financial attached to it. Uh, so if you think about some of the things that um, these plants and other living things are providing uh, to us, we don't really put a price tag on that, but some people have started to do that. So um, watersheds. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with a watershed, but watersheds uh, do a number of things, um, which first of all, stops flooding. Uh, if you have more watersheds, that means that in the springtime when all the snow melts and you have excess rainfall, then all that water can still go somewhere, uh, which is not always the case. Uh, now that we continue to build into some of these uh, locations, we try to increase the drainage, um, we don't have anywhere for that water to go. And so we just end up getting flooding in major cities, which is what we've seen over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, we're continually having more and more flooding in very, very populated areas. Um, on top of that, watersheds do uh, another great thing. They purify water. Uh, those plants will suck up nutrients. Um, in Iowa, uh, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the newspaper, but one of the items that has been talked about recently is that Des Moines is suing other counties within the state uh, because we're we're spending so much money on our water purification system. Um, all the nitrates that are in the water cost us lots and lots of money. And so um, Polk County residents are saying, okay, we didn't put this in the water, but now we have to clean it out. So they're suing um, three counties in northwestern Iowa, I believe, uh, for the cost of cleaning the water. Well, that's where these watersheds would come in handy. If we use, if we utilize these watersheds more, they would actually pull those nitrates out of the water. They wouldn't even make it to the river, or at least if they did make it to the river, they'd make it to the river in much lower quantities than what they have right now. Um, when we talk about some of the other uh, ways that watersheds will purify water, they will pull up heavy metals um, that 
are dangerous to us. So uh, mercury, lead, uh, cadmium, um, some of these items are very, very dangerous to us and these plants will kind of hold on to them for a while uh, while they break down or they at least um, don't end up in our water. They stay in the bodies of the plants um, and then get recycled back into the crust uh, rather than uh, being put into the water and then have us drink it. The one that everybody kind of ignores is oxygen. You know, without plants, without trees, grasses, all these uh, number uh, numbers of plants um, and algae that are around, uh, we wouldn't have oxygen. Um, and so, yes, those plants need the oxygen as well to in order to go through cellular respiration, but they uh, also provide that for us. Um, not intentionally, but uh, it is an important byproduct. And so what value do you want to put on breathing? Um, what dollar value are we going to start charging? Um, for this and this in the past I've uh, shown or read segments of uh, the Lorax by Dr. Seuss um, where they are selling air um, kind of fits well right here because we are that's essentially what we're trying to do is put a value on that is like what value does a tree have right now the value that a tree has is what can I turn it into what value is paper how much can I sell paper for how much can I um, make pencils for uh, how about you know siting for houses. Uh, what can I make out of this? Um, and we don't think about the actual processes, the services that they're giving to us. But more than that, we can also look at population control. So this is less of the plants um, providing population control, but some of the animals. Um, one of that uh, everybody kind of complains about in Iowa, but doesn't think about the cause of it, is our deer population. We have a uh, very large number of deer and um, when people bring that up I sometimes ask them well, why is that why do we have so many deer like oh well, we have lots of corn for them to eat it's like that's true um, deer can eat a lot of different types of plants um, corn is just one of the grasses that they can uh, that they can eat um, but that is not really an issue or hasn't been an issue in the past um, because there have been uh, natural predators to keep their populations down uh, by humans coming in and essentially chasing out all the natural predators, um, you know, which mainly in my mind, uh, I think of mountain lions. They are a huge predator of deer. They would keep the populations low, but we don't really have a whole lot of mountain lions um, in the state. Obviously, there are other predators as well, but if you think about all the predators that are around, um, virtually none of them are big enough or can survive in large enough numbers in order to take down a full-sized deer. Um, even though we don't think of deer as being dangerous, um, they can fight back and they, they can um, kill uh, a predator uh, with a good kick, um, even without antlers. Um, they, can, they can kill somebody. So a lone coyote is not probably going to want to take down a full-sized deer. Uh, so that's just one of the other ideas about how nature uh, provides services to us um, that we don't really think about. So um, if I went through and I calculated the number of uh, deer accidents, uh, if I could quantify how many of those accidents um, would not occur if we had more mountain lions around, could I give value to those mountain lions, a numerical um, monetary value? Um, so that's just one thing to be uh, thinking about. Okay, so ecology, uh, and I know that the name has been changed to environmental science, which I think is more appropriate. Uh, a lot of people say the word ecology and they don't truly understand what that is. Ecology is a study of living organisms um, and how those living organisms and non-living or uh, non-living items work together in nature. But as a whole, when people say ecology, a lot of times they think environmental science um, or in environmental, uh, you know, tree huggers, um, if you if you want to use that term. Um, you know, I'm not offended by it. It's like, that's fine. I'm a tree hugger. I'm, I'm fine with it. But uh, a lot of people don't understand that term truly. Um, so in order to understand uh, what ecology is, then first uh, you have to study what those uh, the structure of the natural systems are. Okay, so um, the biggest natural system, oh, excuse me, uh, the biggest natural system that we have is uh, the biosphere. Um, if you break down that word, bio means life, sphere is a circle or a circle with depth to be more precise. Um, and so the uh, living sphere is Earth. 
Um, and so that is our largest biological system. Now we break it up into little tiny pieces, but um, to be honest, it's really one big connected system. Um, and when we think about the Earth and what's living on Earth, there really isn't that much uh, area um, that is being lived on. Um, we have a very, very narrow area. So once you get, you know, deep into the earth, there's really not a whole lot living there. And there's really not a whole lot uh, high up in uh, the sky either. Um, but this biosphere is made up of uh, mostly carbon because we're all carbon based life forms. Um, so we're taking lots of uh, carbon through sugars and we're giving off carbon dioxide, uh, lots of minerals um, and primarily water. You know, that's the one thing that all uh, scientists have been able to find about living things is that every living thing requires some amount of water, some more than others, uh, but all of them need liquid water. So living things can go as high as 11,000, I'm sorry, as low as 11,000 meters um, under the ocean um, or in the ocean, uh, all the way up to uh, 9,000 meters above the land. Uh, but that's pretty rare. Uh, most of the life that we find is only 200 meters uh, down and as high as 6,000 meters up. Um, and a lot of that, at least down, the biggest issue is uh, light. If that's our main source of energy, then things can't live uh, deep down because there's not enough energy down there. There are very few organisms that go deep, deep, deep into the ocean because um, there's no access to energy or very little access to energy. Um, high up, we run into some other issues like thin oxygen, um, and you need that oxygen in order to survive. Okay, so uh, the biosphere is a closed system, meaning that stuff doesn't generally come in and out. I mean, yeah, there are some things um, that leave. You know, we do have helium that escapes. Um, we do have, uh, you know, small meteorites and things like that uh, that add to our, our biosphere. But those are pretty small when you talk about how big the biosphere really is. Um, so really sunlight is the only thing that comes in and virtually all uh, things on all life on the planet um, is powered by the sun. Um, and so something that we need to think about, and we'll address this later on in the semester, but even the energy from uh, burning coal, natural gas, oil, um, or wood comes from sunlight. Uh, but that sunlight fell on earth maybe um, hundreds or even millions or billions of years ago, depending on what your source is. Um, you know, billions is a little extreme, but really hundreds of millions of years ago is uh, very, very reasonable. Um, so coal is a major source of energy for us. That's where we're getting most of our energy right now. So that coal comes from uh, living organisms that died uh, hundreds of millions of years ago and they were not decomposed by bacteria, uh, by fungus. Um, so they were stored, those uh, carbon bonds, those carbon-carbon bonds, uh, those sugars um, were stored in a way that we can now break the bonds and release that energy. But that energy uh, was built through photosynthesis. Um, it took sunlight, built bonds, and now we're breaking those bonds, uh, releasing that energy now. So because the Earth is a closed system, all the materials, all the actual atoms have to be recycled. The energy is a continuous input. Once we run out of that, um, the, the system will die because there's no new energy being put into it. But um, the materials themselves, the atoms, do all get recycled. Okay, so uh, for, and when you took biology, introductory biology, uh, we looked at some of these different items um, of the different biomes. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but there are several different biomes. Um, so they can be terrestrial, meaning land-based or aquatic. Uh, but we can break these apart uh, based on what types of characteristics they have. So, you know, you have deserts, you have rainforests, you have um, temperate grasslands. Um, you, there's a number of different types of biomes, um, each with very, very specific characteristics. Okay, so... Really, what is an ecosystem? All ecosystems are made out of living and non-living pieces. So biotic, if I say bio, bio is life. That's a prefix for life. So we're talking about living things. Abiotic is non-living things. So some examples of uh, abiotic factors that you might want to think about. You might want to pause right now and discuss some of those. So there are a variety of different abiotic factors. We could talk about gases. We could talk about light itself. That's an abiotic factor. It's not alive. Um, 
But some of the nutrients that we uh, take in, either personally or plants, um, they are going to uh, be non-living as well. So the soil, the water, all these things are abiotic. So abiotic factors uh, change throughout the day or from season to season. Uh, you know, like right now, um, we are not producing as much oxygen. The earth in general is not producing as much oxygen because most of the land mass is in the northern hemisphere. Well, the northern hemisphere is in winter right now. So um, we're kind of getting a buildup of CO2 at this moment um, because all the animals are using that up. Uh, we're, things are decomposing, um, but where there's just not a whole lot of oxygen being put back into the system right now. But as summer comes along, that will reverse. Um, and so you end up getting these, these spikes that go up and down. Um, and so people think that there's a significant change, but really it doesn't change all that much over the year. It just changes within the year. Okay. So in order for most organisms to survive, they have to be able to uh, survive in a range of conditions. These conditions uh, change normally. Um, one of those uh, conditions is how much energy um, you might be getting. Uh, so if you can survive on less food, that might give you an advantage over some of your other competitors. Um, so we have different levels. Again, this is from introductory biology. Uh, our producer level has lots and lots of energy. Each trophic level, less and less energy is passed on. So we have our herbivores. They only eat uh, plants. We have carnivores. Um, uh, and then we have our primary, or I'm sorry, our secondary uh, carnivores that are going to eat other carnivores. Um, and so there, there are very, very few of these top level carnivores because they do require so much energy. Um, and there's not all that much energy getting up there. Okay, so trophic levels can be represented in any sort of uh, system. So again, we have producers, those would be algae and aquatic plants in this situation. We have our herbivores, uh, and then our her herbivores are eaten by um, many carnivores, and then those carnivores are eaten by um, higher level carnivores. Usually we don't have more than uh, four levels because so much energy is lost that by the time you get to a next level, there's really nothing to be passed on. Okay, so just a, a quick review. You can pause this if you need to glance through what these different um, types of groups are. Uh, but I just have producers, herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, um, detritivores, and decompo decomposers. Uh, the ones that you're probably least familiar with are, uh, well, really, the one that you're uh, least familiar with is detritivores. Um, those are uh, like vultures, um, skunks, uh, animals that are eating the dead remains, but they're not technically decomposers. So if you need to look through that, uh, go ahead and pause the video and uh, remind yourself of some of these uh, different items. Okay, so looking at energy, we have to uh, follow a food path. So in this case, algae starts off uh, absorbing energy from the sun, eaten by smaller organisms. So the herbivores, the herbivores are eaten by uh, the cod um, and it just keeps going up. And so this would be an example of a food chain. However, that's kind of overly complicated because killer whales eat more than just leopard seals. Leopard seals eat more than just cod and cod eat more than just krill. So we come up with a food web, which shows a lot of the different interactions. Ideally, it would be all of the interactions um, in a system. Uh, that's very, very unlikely, but at least this shows more of the different things that killer whales eat. They eat crab eater seals, they eat leopard seals, they eat elephant seals, squid, penguin. They eat lots of different foods, and so this uh, just represents that a little bit better. Okay, so here's a simplified version of some of our um, examples of how nitrogen is, like I said earlier, uh, atoms are recycled. And so this is just an example of how nitrogen is recycled. Um, it's kind of a simplified version. Um, so we have nitrogen in the atmosphere, um, and then it has to be uh, fixed by bacteria in the soil. Okay, um, that bacteria in the soil uh, turns it into um, nitrates, and then those are taken up by plants. Um, now, it's it looks a little bit more complicated than it is, uh, but some of these, when when we die, we have nitrogen in our body. That nitrogen gets broken down by decomposers, um, turns into ammonia. That's why uh, your cat litter box, if you go change that, um, it smells awful. It smells like ammonia. It's because it is. It's decomposing, and um, it's uh, the urea that was in the cat's urine, um, it's a nitrogen source, is broken down into ammonia. 
And so that has to be recycled by bacteria and then it will be taken up by plants again, um, or it might go back into the air. Uh, but we just have this big cycle and so living things are part of these uh, cycles and they are an important part of it. Okay, one of the things that I kind of wanted to have you take a look at here was um, based on the amount of food that we eat, uh, whether or not we are eating efficiently. And looking at, uh, at this particular picture, um, if we compared ourselves to different organisms, so in this one, um, the hens eat grasshoppers. Um, if we eat these hens, um, then 365 hens um, a year could feed one human. Um, the amount of energy that is in that that one hen. Uh, if you compare that to the amount of energy that we would get from eating just the straight uh, grasshoppers, we could feed 15 as many uh, humans um, if we ate the grasshoppers directly rather than eating the hens directly. Um, so, or eating the hens secondary. Um, so maybe think about that when we're talking about food and how, what our efficient use of food is or lack of efficient use. Um, what I'm gonna ask you to do here is, uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about this later on, but I'm gonna ask you to take a look at the uh, paper that I have given you um, or that I put on Schoology. Uh, I would like you to read through that and determine uh, what the, so I'd like you to try to uh, do a compare and contrast look at whether or not you think humans are accelerating the uh, rate of extinction in organisms um, because looking at some of these things like the ability of organisms to survive, then we need to determine what our role is in the possibility of increasing that uh, extinction rate. Thank you.